Hello and welcome to Wineskins, a program featuring reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of topics and issues from a Catholic perspective. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda. Our show is sponsored by the Annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our show today, I will interview Bishop George Murray in part four of our series on racism called Removing Barriers. We will also hear more about the Holy Triduum and the readings for this Palm Sunday of the Passion of the Lord. That and more on Wineskins. I'd like to welcome back Patty Candelo to Wineskins. She is the parish leader at Holy Family Church in Brewster and Navarre. Welcome back to Wineskins. Thank you so much for inviting me back. You know, last time that you were with us, we spoke about your role as a parish leader. I think what I'd like us to talk about now is just parish ministry in general. You know, when we say parish ministry, that's kind of like an umbrella for so many different things. When I say ministry in the church and in the parish, what first comes to mind? Interestingly, I I believe that word ministry is a, a word that evolves. You know, so many times, and I am the perfect example, when I took on my first job for the church, it was in RCIA. And through RCIA as the coordinator, it became a ministry. It totally mm-hmm. took my heart, my faith deepened. And I think that's where it comes. You know, when you might ask someone that you see somebody has certain gifts and you ask them, would you be interested in doing this or doing that? And you see them start to evolve and suddenly this has taken on a whole new life for them because the Lord has just captured their heart and the Holy Spirit just surrounds them and goes for it. It's wonderful. You know, it's interesting as you were talking, what came to my mind is that, you know, sometimes we get to a point, unfortunately, in our lives where things become a job in mm-hmm. the church and not a ministry. Right. And it's trying to reclaim that mm-hmm. and gain that kind of like spark again, that all we do as people of God and as the body of Christ is really ministry. Mm -hmm. And how do you enable the folks that you minister to in Navarre and Brewster to understand that their lives as Catholic Christians is really ministry? I think no matter what the job is that you have in church, no matter what it is that you've been asked to do, I think it's doing the very best that you can of that and then and praising that person to say, hey, look what you just did. Perfect example is my very first week there, I gave a prayer shawl to someone who had a sister who was going into hospice. And someone who was there at the table said, I could do that. And I said, sure. You know, I showed her the prayer shawl. Right. And within a week, she had seven done. Wow. And now she is running the prayer shawl ministry mm-hmm. for our church mm-hmm. that she had never in a million years thought she'd do. It's finding those gifts and letting them run with it and letting the spirit run with it. I think that's it. And the other thing is that we all have a niche. You know, Mm -hmm. we all have particular gifts and it's just finding the right spot. But I've often wondered and thought that the best approach is a one-on-one personal approach. You know, when we talk about evangelization, you know, we could send out letters, we could do this and that, but it's the one-on-one meeting people. And that's ultimately how Jesus got his disciples. He met them face-to-face and one-on-one, and how important it is for us to really call people into the church and into ministry. That That, would be your experience? Absolutely. I think it's saying, you know, wow, this was really wonderful what you did, but you realize that you were just the hands, the feet, the voice, and the touch of Christ Mm -hmm. in doing that, and what you reflected on other people, they're going to reflect, and that light is going to continue on. And I think sometimes people don't realize that. They think, oh, I was just serving pasta. No, you weren't serving pasta. You were serving souls. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, the other interesting thing that I find, at least in my experience, is that if we invite people into things, time and talent, then we have to make sure that we continue to engage them. We can say, okay, we need plumbers to help out. And we really don't engage them. We really need to say, okay, you have these gifts and talents, so this is how we can use you in the church. As far as I'm concerned, there's a place for everybody Mm -hmm. to do something in the church, whether it's an active role or a passive role in prayer, whatever that is. What would be your hope as you continue your ministry as a parish leader for the folks that you minister to and beyond? Okay, let's say for a plumber, for the example. So if I have a plumber that is there, someone who's doing this wonderful work, 
it's not just that work. Find out about that person. You know, tell me, tell me about your family. Tell me about what you're doing. And, you know, the stories start to come out of who this person is and why they are there. And that starts to link people together and it becomes their ministry then and it becomes outreaching to other people because you don't know what that story is, you know. And sure. it's amazing to me when people start talking about things that they do and they don't see it, that they have just brought Christ to someone. You know, it's interesting because unless we do that, then we're not being about who we are and what we are as the body of Christ. Right. Petty, what would you tell us priests? You know, that's a lot of times we need to continue to listen to the people to understand what the needs and the expectations are. But what would you like to tell priests? Listen. I think that is really listen to the heart and advice that I got which was the best advice I got from two people, two priests, when I got to there was just love them. Just love the people no matter what, because it can get nitty gritty and you're down to all kinds of things that people want from you and are grabbing at you, but truly just just love them and to listen to what they need. I think that really means everything. Well, Patty Candela, we know that you certainly do that as a parish leader, but we certainly appreciate the time, the talent, and the gift of treasure that you are Thank to the you. folks at Holy Family. Thank you so and, much. And uh, continue with your good work and blessings from the Lord. Thank you. Thank you very much. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. The Holy Triduum are the three days celebrating the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. To tell us more is Brother Dominic Calabro. He is the production assistant at CTNY and a member of the Society of St. Paul in Canfield. For Roman Catholic Christians, the Easter Triduum, or Paschal Triduum, is the three-day liturgical season that concludes Lent and introduces the joy of the Easter season. It begins on the evening Feast of Holy Thursday and includes Good Friday, Holy Saturday, and Easter Sunday. Its three 24-hour periods include the major feast for all four days at the heart of the Easter celebration. The Easter Triduum memorializes the suffering, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Technically speaking, the Triduum refers simply as any three-day period of prayer, recalling the three days that Christ spent in the tomb, but in common usage, any reference to the Triduum refers to the Easter Triduum beginning on Holy Thursday and ending with Easter Sunday. Starting with the Mass of the Lord's Supper on the evening of Holy Thursday, continuing through Good Friday service and Holy Saturday, and concluding evening prayer on Easter Sunday, the Easter Triduum marks the most significant events of Holy Week, also known as Passion Tide. On Holy Thursday, the Triduum begins for Catholics with the evening Mass of the Lord's Supper, during which bells are rung and the organ is played. The bells and organ will then remain silent until the Easter Vigil Mass. The Mass of the Lord's Supper includes a ritual washing of feet. For Catholics, the Good Friday Church ceremony is marked by a ritual unveiling of the main cross near the altar. For this is the day that marks the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Catholics ritually kiss the feet of the Jesus figure on the cross. The Catholic worship service also includes communion on this day. After nightfall on Holy Saturday, Catholics hold an Easter Vigil service, which represents the faithful awaiting the resurrection of Jesus Christ after his burial. This service includes a ceremony of light and darkness, in which the Paschal candle is lit to represent the resurrection of Christ. Members of the congregation form a solemn procession to the altar. The Easter Vigil is considered the pinnacle of the Easter Triduum, especially for Catholics and is usually celebrated with a devotion equal to that bestowed on Easter itself. For it is also the time when the church welcomes its newest members who participate fully in the mystery of the church through baptism, confirmation, and Holy Eucharist. Easter Sunday marks the end of the Triduum and the beginning of the seven-week Easter season that will end with Pentecost Sunday. Easter Day church services for Catholics is a joyous celebration of resurrection and rebirth of Jesus and humankind. Popular Easter symbolism includes many images of rebirth as found in the world of nature and from religious tradition through history. For Wineskins, I'm Brother Dominic Calabro. 
welcome to our show, Removing Barriers. I'm Father Jim Corda. With me is Bishop George Murray, who is the chair of the Bishop's Ad Hoc Committee Against Racism. Welcome. Happy to be with you, Father. In this segment, I think we'd like to tackle some difficult issues. When we talk about racism, we also have to look at certain ideologies. There are certain groups of people whose ideology is totally racist. Why is it important for us to talk about that? For example, white supremacy, the Ku Klux Klan. Why is it important for us to at least address those issues and ideologies when we talk about racism? It's important because of the fact that we have to bring out into the light what is often done in darkness so that everyone can see what are these groups really saying? Sometimes these groups try to present themselves as we're only protecting our constituents or protecting the people that in our neighborhoods. It's much more than that. There is an ideology that drives white supremacist ideas that if, if you, you, you can just go on the internet, you can look this up and look at various groups. They talk about how white people in the United States are superior to everybody and that white people in the United States therefore have a right to everything that is the United States. And they make it very clear that anyone who is not white has no rights, has no reason to exist. It, it gets that serious. Neo-Nazis, we saw that in, in, in Charlottesville, marching past a Jewish synagogue and the synagogue having hired guards to protect the building. Neo-Nazis see absolutely no value in the lives of Jewish people. And these groups, whether they are white supremacists, neo-Nazis, or any other group, any group that does not recognize and or refuses to recognize the value of every human being is not Christian. And yet, many of these groups will pride themselves and brag about how Christian they are. This is what they say and what they do is clearly contrary to the gospel. And it is totally. How could one be Christian and espouse Jesus as their Lord and Savior, mm -hmm. an example of Christian life, and yet have this total ideology that completely debases certain parts of humanity. Yes. Let's go back to that whole sense of supremacy. You had mentioned about bringing it out into the light. Why are people more comfortable in the shadows and in the darkness than in the bright light of truth? Back in August, when the president of the Bishop's Conference asked me to be the chair of this Committee Against Racism, I was doing an interview and the person conducting the interview said to me, why do we need to talk about this in public? Why can't we talk about this in quiet, in, in back rooms and all of that? And the person was not saying we shouldn't talk about it. The person was simply saying, this is a difficult topic. Many people don't feel comfortable talking about it. Can't we talk about it in a more private way? My response to her is the same as my response in terms of why we need to bring this out into the light. It's because the results of racist attitudes are not private. They are very public. When a Hispanic child is walking through a neighborhood to go to school and has to endure catcalls from people sitting on their porches because she is Hispanic, that is very public. When that woman was killed in Charlottesville who was there to call for racial justice, that was a public act. When in situations that we've seen across our country where there have been these clashes between various white supremacist groups and others and people have walked away bloody, that's public. What we have to do is bring what is done in the darkness out into the light. The scriptures tell us that because the light burns away all the excuses and all of the attempts to avoid the truth. The truth of the matter is that we are all created by God and loved by God. Racism denies that. 
And if we allow racism to continue in the shadows, then we promote it. By bringing it out into the light, we challenge races to look at themselves and look at others and see where they are similar and where they are different. We know that for every wrong deed, there are consequences. Yes. So what would be some of the consequences or punishments for racism? Does that make sense? I think if, if I understand you correctly, the consequences of racism are the consequences of sin. Racism is a sin, and it is a sin that when we behave in that way, we need to take that seriously as a serious sin, and we need to take that to the sacrament of penance and ask God's forgiveness. So we are all going to stand before the Lord and be judged, and the Lord reads our hearts. If we have racist ideas in our hearts, the Lord then will hold us accountable for that. How do we latch on to that hopefulness in all of this. Will racism disappear? Will prejudice disappear? Will discrimination disappear because of our efforts? Will it lessen? Will it lighten the load? How do we go about bringing that change and addressing that sin of racism? Well, that's exactly what the Committee Against Racism is, is working on. We do not want to issue statements. We want to bring people together to understand how racism rears its ugly head in different contexts and then help people to begin a conversation so that they can move beyond stereotypes and preconceived notions and come to understand each other and respect each other. I have great hope for the youth of our country because I see in them, when I visit our schools and talk to young people, I see in them a desire to not allow this stain on the American experience to spread. And I see in talking to many older people a realization that we haven't done enough. Bringing that together, I think we can conquer this problem. To receive more information on that and other issues, and to listen to Wineskins, visit the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown at www.doy.org. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. At the Foot of the Cross is a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. It is a reflection on the Gospels of the Sundays of Lent and Holy Week. Your program host is Father Jim Corda. Imagine a crowd that celebrates the inauguration of a new president. Flags line the parade route. People line up 10 deep to get a glimpse at the new president. Cheers of jubilation can be heard from the crowd. The parade marks the beginning of a new journey and a new chapter in the history of the country. It is a time of hope where everything seems possible. But for others, that parade signals the beginning of the end. It was not their candidate who won. And worse yet, some of those people who were part of the former administration will no longer have jobs. Still, there are others who could care less about the parade or even about politics or even the president for that matter. It is neither historic nor joyful. It is just another day. It was the Palm Sunday parade. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. And the people on that parade route that day acclaimed him as their king. For many, there were joyful shouts of adulation and hope. And yet for some, it symbolized a threat to their own religious leadership. For the crowd that day, they sang hosannas. And for others, the shadow of murder fell upon the faces and hearts of the threatened. Some saw Jesus as the long-awaited gift of God and as the promised Messiah. Others saw Jesus as a threat. But what was in the heart of Jesus that day? Maybe it wasn't the shouts of joy that he heard so loud among the throngs of people in the parade that day, or even the pain of the enemy's plot against him. Perhaps the deepest pain that Jesus felt in his heart that day was from those who simply saw nothing and felt nothing. For many, it was just another day. And maybe that is the greatest pain in the heart of Jesus on this Palm Sunday. Could it be the apathy that Jesus senses in those who simply see nothing, feel nothing, or think nothing? 
And here's a thought for us. As we stand at the foot of the cross and prepare to enter the holiest week of the Christian year, who are we along the parade route this Palm Sunday? Is it just another day, same old thing? Or do we join in with the adulation of the Hosannas and cry out with one voice, blessed be the son of David who comes in the name of the Lord. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Our song today is by the Kellenberg Memorial High School Choir. It is from their CD entitled Prayers and Praise. You loved me when I was so Our scripture reflections for this Palm Sunday of the Passion of the Lord will be by Father Chris Cicero. He is pastor of St. Jude Church in Columbiana and Our Lady of Lords Church in East Palestine. On Palm Sunday, the church traditionally reads the Passion of Our Lord, which recounts the final hours of Christ's life. The long form of the Passion reading, according to Mark, includes the agony in the garden, one of my favorite passages of scripture. After the Last Supper, Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. There, Jesus said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to you. Take this cup away from me, but not what I will, but what you will. 
we see in this passage that the Lord Jesus was grappling with the Father. Think about who Jesus was, a young man just 33 years old. He had family and friends. His ministry of preaching and healing was just in its third year. Naturally, Jesus didn't want to give all of that up. He wasn't ready to depart from this world, and he expressed that in his prayer. Unlike sinners, Jesus, however, did not insist on his own will. He did not count the cost or throw a fit. He told the Father the truth of how he was feeling. He said, Take this cup away from me. But then he continued, Not what I will, but what you will. Jesus' acceptance of God's will is like a profession of vows. He promises at the level of his mind, his heart, his will, to offer his life in accord with the Father's plan. First he promised in the garden. Then on the next day, Good Friday, Jesus professed that same promise in the flesh. On Good Friday, he was humiliated, mocked, abused, nailed to the cross, and left to die. These two moments, the promise in the garden and his death on Calvary, are two parts of the same sacrifice. We can learn from Jesus. Sometimes we are willing to profess faith on the lips and even in the heart, but then we fall short of letting that faith direct the way that we live in the flesh. The point is that God wants all of us. He wants the heart, the mind, the will, and the flesh. I dare say that it is not very likely that we will be called to actually die for our faith, as Jesus did. But we still keep our flesh in the game. We do this by outwardly witnessing to the faith in the world. We do things like display sacred images or make the sign of the cross, even when we know it could bring scorn. Our bodies engage faith when we practice chastity and when we refrain from immoral behavior, such as the things that could harm us, drugs, abuse of alcohol, and the like. God showed in the agony of the garden and the crucifixion that he wants all of us. And today, we enter into Holy Week. We commemorate what Jesus did. Let us consider what we can do to offer all of ourselves for him. For Wineskins, I'm Father Cicero. We remember with devotion this triumphal entry that Jesus made, so let us follow him with a lively faith. United with him and his suffering on the cross, may we share his resurrection and new life. Wineskins is made possible by the annual Bishop's Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. The program is produced by CTNY, the Catholic Telecommunications Network of Youngstown. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a blessed Sunday and a safe Holy Week.